started. Um, without further ado, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Louise Caron. I am the executive director here at the Center for Art Law. Um, thank you for joining us in this digital space and for our first launch talk of the summer and the official launch of the Artist Legacy and Estate Planning Clinic. Um, thank you to our speakers, Charlie Hewitt, as well as Matthew Erskine, whom I'm our moderator, Irina Tarsis, will present in a few seconds. Um, thank you also to Minelli, Takumbo, Andrea, Claire, um, all the rest of the center's staff for helping in putting this uh, program together. So if this is the first time that you are attending a Center for Art Law event, um, I'm gonna give you a brief snapshot of this wonderful organization. We are based in Brooklyn. Um, we're a, an educational nonprofit dedicated to offering resources and programming for the advancement of a vibrant arts and law community worldwide. So we have a website, newsletter, uh, fantastic resources, um, as well as a lot of programs. And uh, now fully online, the Center for Art Law facilitates conversations by hosting um, and participating in programs such as today. Um, we also have an internship program that allows students to get firsthand experience in arts and cultural heritage law. Um, this does not even begin to tell you and explain everything that we do. So we invite you to subscribe to our newsletter, um, to receive updates and to visit our website. Um, you may also consider becoming a member because this will give you access to recordings of past, past Art Law Lunch Talk. Um, so before we begin a few of the usual housekeeping items, um, this program is currently recording for archival purposes. Feel free to turn off your camera. Everybody will be muted except for the panelists for the duration of the program. If you have any questions for our panelists, please ask them using the chat box at the bottom of your screen. We will be monitoring the chat and sending links to relevant articles and cases throughout the discussion um, and will help helpfully help with tech issues and practical questions. Um, I, a link to the handouts with bios and uh, reading materials was also sent to you earlier today. Um, so I and I will put the link shortly in the chat. They will also be emailed to you after the program along with a brief survey um, with, where you can let us know what you thought about the program and what other topics are of interest to you. So now without further ado, uh, let me introduce Irina Tarsis, the founder, managing director of the Center for Art Law, who will introduce the speakers and get the conversation started. Thank you so much, Louise. Um, we have um, been listening to feedback that the center has received last year um, with the launch of our immigration law clinic. and. This year, we decided that the next important subject is to talk about artist legacy and estate planning subjects. So uh, there has been um, a lineup of outstanding speakers and programs prepared for you. We started talking about tax issues and I think some people fell asleep. So this is to wake you up. Um, we are talking with Charlie Hewitt, who is a very talented and very funny artist, which I find a remarkable combination. Um, and Matthew Erskine, who is um, not a fourth generation attorney, but he is um, an attorney with vast experience uh, dealing with um, estates and collectors and artists. So we are in very good company. Please, can we um, go forward a couple of slides, please? So this is your um, lineup. And if you have more questions about estate planning uh, subjects, please um, consider joining us for our um, conversations um, that continue through June and July. And at the end of July, we're hoping to have um, actually uh, an opportunity to put artists and attorneys into this separate uh, Zoom rooms, breakout rooms for a Q&A that hopefully will help individual um, persons figure out uh, what they would like or they would hate uh, doing with their estates. So um, I feel that the Center for Art Law is a wonderful resource, but we're definitely standing on the shoulders of giants. Every time we um, turn to a subject, there has been a lot of work done in advance before we came to the scene. So we can learn from wonderful experiences and terrible experiences that have happened. Um, in this reel. Uh, the handout that Louise mentioned contains um, a very brief, I think, lineup of uh, cases and um, publications that you may want to take a look before our next um, program. However, 
if we can see the next scene. Um, our intent was not to um, talk about American Gothic or anything, but um, Louise, can you show us um, what happened um, yesterday? If um, any of you are following, um, there was a settlement just in time uh, in connection with a saga that lasted for three years involving Robert Indiana estate. Uh, we're happy to send you the list of players, plaintiffs and defendants. It's a long list. Um, and it seems like um, a part two of the um, Rothko estate legal um, courtroom drama that we are happy to learn from, hopefully, and not to repeat some of the mistakes. Um, Charlie uh, kindly mentioned that um, he, he might talk about some of the um, characters in the Robert Indiana saga. Um, Louise, is that, can we go forward? Um, but you may have seen this sculpture in different cities uh, or private um, residences. Uh, the market, secondary market for Robert Indiana's work is pretty hot. Um, it's uh, maybe a good problem to have, um, unless there are too many cooks in the kitchen and unless they're, um, you know, if you're thinking about going to a remote island, I think um, those of you who have not seen American Gothic might um, feel like they're reliving it. All right, so this is the mise-en-scene. Um, the next slide is only um, intended to tell you that one of the participants, one of the plaintiffs in the Robert and Indiana story saga is a Morgan Art Foundation. I was very excited to find out that there was this foundation, maybe artist endowed. Um, then I learned it was not a nonprofit. Then I learned it was not in incorporated in New York or Maine, um, as I had expected. It was about, or it is still is the Bahamas based limited liability company. It is mentioned in the Fonseca uh, papers, the Panama papers. So it's a gift that keeps on giving. And um, we should read the complaint and we should read uh, between the lines about uh, who has the power, copyright to decide what becomes artist's legacy. All right, um, the cautionary tale is finished. Now we're talking about what can artists um, do with their works after they are created. And Charlie Hewitt is our expert in-house. He has uh, done artworks for a few years or a few decades. He's represented by um, a wonderful gallery uh, of Jim Kempner. Um, one of the projects that Charlie and Jim have done together is uh, create a series called The Madness of Art. And um, we're here to hear from Charlie about um, what madness, madness can be avoided when talking about artists' legacy. Charlie, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, <clears throat> well, thank you. I mean, I, I don't, <clears throat> when I was asked to do this, my first response, and I was talked about the legacy of artists and the preservation of my work uh, by gifting to institutions, cultural institutions, and what I do after death. Well, I didn't like any of the, I didn't like any of the options to be quite frank. I don't like the dying part. I like the living part. I don't like the bookkeeping part. I don't like the legal part. And I don't like museums. I think that's where art goes to die. And I happen to be on an interesting place here between Robert Indiana and Charlie Hewitt and, and the watercolor artist down the street. If at my age, 74, <clears throat> I had a legacy that was valuable, people would be knocking on my door already. That doesn't mean, that means it diminishes me as an artist at all, not in any respect whatsoever. But what I'm getting at here is something like, sometimes I don't feel like artists are children, but we enjoy playing in that space that doesn't have boundaries, that doesn't have legal ramifications that doesn't have these kinds of problems. I have known artists who have <clears throat> burned their work. I have known artists who gave, one artist, a wonderful artist who gave his entire collection away to a low level mafia guy in Jersey who lost it. Uh, and then at, after his death, his work became valuable and we tried to track it down. I mean, these are, these are kind of family stories. Let me put it like that amongst artists. These are kind of cautionary tales. Some artists see a studio full of work and at the end of their life and see failure because it didn't sell. Other artists see it as a fabulous legacy to a, 
grand attempt at doing something bold and wonderful with their lives. I see it as part of my process. I called, simply I called my CPA and I said to her, what happens when I pass away? Will my wife be responsible for paying huge taxes? And she said, no. That made me feel good. That was the one thing I've done since we started talking a couple of weeks ago. So I'm gonna continue making, not seeing the building of my career and my work as a detriment after 70 to my legacy or to my family's ability to have an income past my lifespan but more of a kind of a continuum of what I need to do as an artist to get out of bed in the morning and get up the next day and continue to create and leave my problems to somebody else. Now, when I put this together, I have a small slide narrative that will explain what's going on because the, the paradigm is shifting. For example, this is a body of work I put together actually during the pandemic. I just, I would made a prints. I made 27 prints. I ran 30 editions of them. Well, in total, I have 850 images out there. That's one of the problems with creating this kind of work. Now I have 850 pieces. They're going to go out to the Mezzanine Gallery at the Met, Jim Kentner's, the Cove Street Gallery. I've got five or six venues for them, but I'm going to end up more than likely with a lot of work left over in the racks. Now, as an artist, I want, I made an addition of 30 because I'm an optimist. I believe there are 30 people that out there in the world that want each and every one of these. Because if I lose my audience, I have no reason to get up and make art. I believe every day there's somebody who wants something that I have to say. Now, when I start thinking about, do these pieces now have to be corralled and so to speak and, get, and offered up to institutions? Now. I have Bates College owns all of my print work, my paperwork. Bowdoin College owns a huge amount of my early work in the 80s. So I'm archived in those collections because the prints are easier to get into the institution because quite simply, they can't afford storage for everything, curating, insuring. So if I dumped them my entire collection, they'd have to go buy a warehouse and uh, they, they would do it for certain reasons I don't have. So this slide, let me go back. This slide represents a volume of work. Let's go to the next one. Now, this is again, the same picture, but if you look up to the upper left, another thing I've gotten involved in, I'm making retro marquee signs. And this thing hit, has hit big. I, I mean, uh, they'll go on. So I have here the old for old paradigm, making prints on a press with a printer, developing 850 uh, images to get out. Back there, I have these hopeful signs, which I have a, a CAD for. I send to a sign shop and I say, make me two. And I don't have to make 800 things and in inventory. It. So my paradigm is shifting considerably. Now, when I, I have this, I send it off to these people and it comes back to me. It comes back sometimes in a truck, 30 feet long or five feet long. It's, a, it's something that, God, I wish I had learned about a long time ago to save me a lot of warehouse space. Uh, so now what's going on is I'm making objects individually one at a time. When I pass away, what would probably be valuable is the opportunity to go make one, a lot like, a lot like Dan Flavin. Dan Flavin has a number of light bulbs fluorescence you can buy you just go to the hardware store and buy one and it has a sticker on the back and that i like i was I, i'm a romantic studio artist so that's why the next side comes into play and that has to do with you know oh no well then uh, i'm sorry this one well this is i'll show the paintings this is what's happening with my work now these are the one on the left going up is a 30 foot piece the other is 24 I, that's not only because I enjoy the ego scale. I just, I'm, I'm outdoors now in these huge environments and these things speak on a different level there rather than the intimacy of a studio. So these have become political somewhat and public art in another way. They are messages. The one on the left is in a factory town of 40,000 people has been on its heels forever. And putting that piece up has lit up the community and driven a whole narrative that, that the town has something 
somebody drops, oh, actually it's my hometown. So I built that there for, my, for the young boy that I live, that lived there, just so I put it on the wall and I gave it to him. The one on the left is in Portland, Maine in a much more successful art environment, but it's at an intersection and people are surprised by it. And guess what? That is a gift as well. In the meantime, United Way of Maine is putting up eight of them in all these communities all over the state. Uh, they're making beer can labels out of them. Hannaford's our great department store is doing a hopeful campaign. I've had to turn down, th this, is, I'm not, this is not normal for me. Uh, I feel like Al Pacino sometimes when I do these public things, I become a, this persona that takes over. But what I'm getting at is these things are growing exponentially beyond me. Uh, my gallery sold 30 of them, different sizes, eight foot, 10 feet. They're in public libraries, three public libraries. The town of Eastern Maryland bought six of them just for a hopeful campaign to raise money for a food pantry. Uh, St. Mary's County is putting one in front of their new library in Maryland. I've got requests all over. So this is a paradigm shift from the studio artist, isolated ego in the studio, lash to the mask, painter, that's what the, my old, my description of a white male artist used to be. And I say, you know, I painting. So let's go to the next slide, if you could. Now this is a studio shot of paintings. This is in my soul, in my heart of hearts, I really am a studio artist. That means I'm a journeyman painter. I love to solve paintings with paint. And that's, that's uh, but what I'll do here, like with the prints, the paintings, the prints can all fit into a box, right? Kind of like a writer. You can take eight by 10 vellum and pack your whole thing in a, these paintings take up space. So right now I'm buying a greenhouse for God's sakes. It's 4,000 square foot greenhouse that I'm developing just to put this work in. So the community benefits because I hire carpenters to do this work. I'm developing space to con contain my narrative, keep my work together. So this kind of work, the paintings, I'll paint, I'll say I'll paint 40 paintings next year. I might sell 15, 20 on a good year. I'll inventory the others. So, and that becomes a process of, of discipline and faith. Some of that's built into this, that this work has a life and a value on the other side of it. Uh, but it's uh, traditional. It's on canvas. It has its, uh, it has its parameters. Let's go to the next one. And this is a pile of steel sculpture that I've had in my studio that I just had a metal smith come and throw away. Now, I dumped this work and it was interesting to do. I am so, I go in every day to my studio and I'm grateful. Now that's the kind of decision I made because I've been dragging these darn things around for a decade. Uh, for, uh, they're taking place in a 10 year period. And you know, there's a point when art can become an anchor and only me, only I can make this decision of editing. So the day I put them into this metal guy's truck, I felt depressed. The next morning I was elated because I had room to breathe again and I'm going in another direction. Like I said, the paradigm has shifted. I want to get on that bandwagon. Jim and I just spoke two minutes, three minutes before we got on, Jim's my dealer, about NFTs. I don't know what the hell they are, but I want in. I think it's cool. I want to find out how that'll, how do I take my old 50 year career of Western European training and of drawing, texture, surface, how I take that into this contemporary world and see what I'm made of. And uh, the truth is I'm frightened because I don't know what they're talking about, but I sure plan to find a way in. So, uh, so that's, that said, we talked about that. that. So that work's gone for good or bad, it's over. And uh, there's space now for other things. Is there another slide? I don't know. No, there you go, Matthew. All right, there is a handsome man. So does that have some, give you some idea what I'm talking about? I'm, I am editing my processes. I'm trying to, to bring forward into my life uh, my future, you know, limited amount of work, good work, the things that I've edited out myself. And uh, I'm also very invested I've, in this thing with the hopeful signs. I just made a, 
I've got a commission for a 30 foot light bulb with a 20 foot extension cord on it for public utility. I'm doing an 18 foot cowboy boot for a company in Dallas, Texas. I'm going down next week. It's the coolest thing I've ever made in my life. It, and it took me five minutes to sell it. It was so great. I'm also doing a giant bluebird for top of a deli. And I refuse to put pastrami on it, but he likes the thing. So he's going to go for that. I just did a gay pride hopeful for the specific uh, venue in Portland. In other words, what I'm looking at these steel pieces, you have to come with an F MFA degree to start talking about it. When I come up with my lighted marquee signs, everybody smiles right away. So, and the Charlie, other thing, yeah, I'm going. Charlie, thank you very much. So you, you have mentioned that you are the only one who should be editing uh, what goes into your catalog resume or what will be part of your legacy in the next hundred years. What if somebody picks up one of these works from the scrapyard and is able to sell it? Are you going to care or are you going to say, this is not my work? Oh, no, I wouldn't care at all. I found, but well, actually, I'm, I'm, these guys who picked it up were so excited. I think they're putting it in the back of their scrapyard and having a picnic table. And they, they intimated that it was going to happen because they thought it was so cool. And, you know, I kind of like it. I like pirating art. I like stealing art. I don't mind any of those kinds of plays. I don't have myself connected ego-wise to that kind of money and esteem. Uh, I think I'm fortunate for that. And that's why I can be funny and do madness art. I think we enjoy the irony of the whole thing. I think it'd be kind of funny if somebody picked them up and it found value some other way. Yeah, fine. That's one of the other parts about this estate planning. When you get to museums, then you get people who went to college who are telling you what art is and what's good and what needs to be preserved and what's not good enough. Well, actually what it's really talking about is what's selling on the secondary market. I mean, it could be a bag of horse manure, but if it's got value or if it's the banana taped to the wall of the Guggenheim, this kind of, kind of rubs me when I'm getting to the end of life conversations about my work. I don't want to tell you the truth. I don't care what happens. I spent my whole career worrying about where I'm at in my career. I like to pass away and go to sleep and forget about that. You know what I'm saying? It'd not be my problem any longer. Thank you. So we received a number of questions from some of our participants. I will hold off putting them to you. Um, and I would like to turn uh, the floor to Matthew, who is actually fourth generation estate attorney, um, which means you have a large arsenal of tools uh, to talk about estate planning. Um, Matthew has been speaking with me for months now about the idea of the estate planning clinic for artists. Um, we are trying to figure out if there is a format that the Center for Art Law can offer where artists without galleries, without necessarily means to buy a greenhouse or um, uh, who don't create digital art so that the art they make requires space and storage and insurance and care and curatorship, et cetera, whether it's, a, it's possible to have some kind of a repository for art made by contemporary um, artists who have not been discovered yet, for example. So Matthew, would you please, um, I, I don't know, maybe um, comment on some of the Charlie's comments? Or, Mira, uh, you want me to just jump right in? Exactly. Uh, and, and I think that uh, Charlie um, provides uh, an object example of the fact that whether you're an artist or a collector, uh, if you've seen one collection, uh, you've seen one collection uh, because it's so personality driven. Uh, and, you know, what is the dynamic? Um, artists and collectors are very much like entrepreneurs in that they do what they want to do, not necessarily what they planned out. But then you have a shift. Uh, once you get into a uh, institutional setting, whether it be an estate or a, a donation to a museum, you have a different decision-making process, which is uh, you are now uh, much more uh, sort of deliberate. You know, what is this? Should we buy this? Should we sell that? Should we be going in this direction? Uh, you know, what are the pros and cons? What are the costs? And many times when doing estate planning, uh, people don't realize that the sort of do-it-yourself 
uh, collection management uh, is not something that can be replicated by, uh, you know, when you put it into an institution. So the first question I always ask people is, uh, what is it that you want? Uh, because uh, as the title of this talk says, uh, many times either as an artist or as a collector, what you're trying to do is have an enduring statement of something that's important to you. In some cases, uh, they want to have the physical collection preserved. In other cases, it's a few items of the collection, but then a catalog of the rest of the artwork uh, preserved. Uh, sometimes it's a mix of the both. Some it's, it's given to family and to friends. Uh, and uh, so you really have to be flexible about this. Uh, one of the things that uh, I agree with Charlie that there's a, there's a number of interesting uh, possibilities. The, the non-transferable tokens, which is what he was referring to, essentially is a, a string of, of characters that, that are encrypted that give you the chain of ownership of an asset. Most of the time it's a digital asset, sometimes it can be a physical asset. So what you're really talking about is very much akin to uh, like if you have a Picasso, you can have it certified as a Picasso by the family. So if you think about these non-transferable tokens as a certification that what you have is in fact what you thought you had, it makes it um, a little clearer, I think, on what it is they actually do. Now, the question then comes, if you have an electronic version of it, and could you make it that you have the right to reproduce it? They now have three-dimensional printers, which are capable of doing uh, almost anything. And if you had one that's large enough, you could reproduce a piece of sculpture, you could reproduce an artwork. Uh, so you know, the question is, you know, is that what you're looking at? Um, the, you know, in handling an estate uh, planning for an artist, uh, one of the other issues that you always run into is um, uh, the fact that, you know, many times they can't get help. They may not get help because uh, there's no one trustworthy around. They may not get help because they feel that that's giving up control. And uh, at some point, I mean, there have been a few times, and I suspect that uh, with the Robert Indiana estate, this is the case, which is uh, the client dies and nobody knows what's going on. And it's a disaster. Uh, and so many times I say to people, before you give everything to a foundation, why don't you set up the foundation in a small way, get the people that you want to manage things involved with it now and see if they do a good job. I mean, a, a classic example of this is a, a Doris Duke estate, which after her death, the foundation was run by essentially uh, a, uh, I think it was the equivalent of a butler. Didn't do a bad job, but he really wasn't able to handle such an enormous financial burden on his own. Uh, so there was a lot of controversy for a period of time after her death over how to manage the foundation. Uh, then you get into, uh, now that you sort of know what you want, how do you get there? And uh, there are almost an infinite number of ways of doing that. But it requires that if whatever you're going to be doing, whether it be trusts or foundations, or the sale of the artwork or the gifting of it to family members, you have to understand what that entails. Um, for example, if an artist gives a piece of artwork to a museum, are they also giving the copyrights to that piece? Normally you don't give the copyrights, but sometimes you do. So if Charlie donates the uh, uh, hopeful sign, is that also going to transfer the rights to reproduce it? And this is one of the issues that uh, on the Indiana estate they ran into, which is he transferred the right to reproduce his artwork to the Morgan Foundation. Um, 
which I have to say also, Irene, I thought it was a nonprofit when I first saw it. Um, and then he was in a situation where he couldn't even produce his own artwork. So it, it's, it's an interesting uh, dynamic. Um, I was interested in reading in the handouts that in earlier conversation, they talked about, uh, could you have a collaborative and uh, the, the fundamental thing is, yes, you could have a collaborative where artists and collectors uh, get together, sort of like um, uh, the agricultural cooperative. You know, you, you are pooling your resources to be able to get access to the expertise and experience that you need to do that. Um, it is to a certain degree like herding cats uh, because nobody ever wants to do th something exactly the same. But uh, if you have people who meet their minds, you can do it. Um, we received questions about copyright, tax questions, for example, if uh, beneficiaries who receive a body of work and they don't know what to do with it, it's too big, there's no market for it, the storage costs are immense. And if they destroy the artworks, for example, are there tax implications or are they, um, are there no tax implications? So, if, if you destroy if you destroy a piece of artwork, you will have a uh, a, a loss, a passive loss, because it no longer exists, which is not much use from a tax perspective unless you have passive gains. Um, on the other end of the stick is something like uh, the um, Sonneberg. Uh, estate where they had uh, the painting, uh, I think it was called Canyon, that as part of it, it had a dead bald eagle stapled to a tree, um, which you can't transfer it. And the argument was it's valueless because you can't own or transfer a bald eagle. And the IRS came back and said, it's worth hundreds of millions of dollars because you could sell it to a drug dealer which I didn't quite follow, uh, but it, it just shows that um, when you're dealing with something like, uh, you know, how much is it worth? Valuation can be very subjective. The two aspects of valuation that you always have to think about is, is this in fact what you say it is? And is this in fact the market that you say it is? So if you have uh, a hopeful sign and you're going to be valuing it, you say, is this in fact an authentic hopeful sign or is it a knockoff that somebody did? Uh, and then the second question is, what is the market for that? And uh, so many times when I, you know, people say, well, what's my copyright work? I'm not sure what your copyrights were. Um, recently they had a settlement or the tax court uh, decision in the Michael Jackson estate. And on one hand, the estate said that his uh, sort of uh, artistic remains were worth, you know, a small fraction of what people thought it would be, uh, you know, a couple hundred million dollars total. And on the other end um, of his perspective, you had the IRS who basically said, well, you've got a printing press, press in your basement this is worth an almost infinite amount of money. You should be paying us $400 million worth of taxes. And the tax court came back and said, you're both wrong, but the estate is less wrong than the IRS is. Um, and came out with not quite splitting the baby, but uh, a very, I thought, well thought out decision. But um, I know I have a, a client who donated copyrights, uh, music copyrights to a nonprofit. And at the time they were valued at, let's say $50,000. And because the nonprofit proceeded to work those copyrights much harder than he had ever done, uh, we have to revise his estate tax or his income tax return every year because the value of the actual donation of the copyrights is significantly greater than what the estimated was at the time of his death or time of the donation. So when we are thinking about the subject of estate planning, 
um, for artists. You need an artist, right? And the artist needs to have a, a wish or plan either I will yeah, destroy I mean everything or I would like to be remembered in perpetuity and I would like my works to be exhibited in the same space and the same configuration that I have imposed on this space. Um, what is the lineup? Whom do we need? Uh, whom does the artist need? I imagine you know, there's a, a building with lots of doors and the artist's first door he opens um, is a curator or a gallerist or a tax attorney. Charlie, you said you spoke with your uh, accountant who told you, uh, who put your mind to ease about some tax issues. Do you want to talk to anybody else or have you thought of talking to anybody else? Uh, unfortunately, I have to give you a lawyer answer. <laughs> it depends. Um, most of the time what I uh, tell people is you have to be able to tell me what you've got. So you have to go through and organize things and aggregate them into uh, a, a situation where you say, um, you know, all of my artwork is good, but these are the better pieces and these are the very best. And then you can focus on, you know, what may be the most significant for you to be able to crystallize. And in some, you know, you don't all have to do the same thing with all of your artwork. Some of it you can say, look, this, uh, you know, uh, contacts, uh, you know, the, the, the guy I sell artwork through, put it on the market. It may take you 10 years, but get rid of it, right? These pieces over here, I'd like you to put, you know, uh, a piece in each one of these uh, museums, because I want a piece of mine in each one of these museums. And then I want you to go to a place and I want you to have a, a space that's just my art. Um, the, the problem that you get with people who, it's what I call the embedded in amber collection, is um, the um, Barnes Foundation was a classic example of this, where a collector said, you shall not move anything, you shall not do anything different than I did. It is I, I am, my immortality is established. Fundamentally, uh, that looks great, but they're dead. Uh, and eventually, uh, you know, there, there are a few Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston, which have evolved and grown a bit, but um, places like the Barnes, uh, all you need to do is have one misstep and they're gone. Um, but I noticed there was a, a, a comment that came up on the tax deductibility uh, on, on things. Um, if anybody's got a better crystal ball than I do and can tell me what's gonna happen for the tax law in the next 12 to 18 months, uh, I, I'll be happy to listen to you. But right now, um, your biggest issue is that it's so uncertain. One of the, one of the things that they are now saying is uh, we are now going to make you pay capital gains whenever you transfer your asset. So if you gift the artwork to a family member, we're going to make you pay capital gains. It'll be a realized transaction. The other thing that, uh, the, 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 and this is the, you know, we want to break up concentrations of wealth, is that uh, there's a proposal that every periodically after ever so many years, we're going to have you pay capital gains tax on it. So let's say every 20 years you have to pay it. Well, if you have an art collection and not a lot of money, how do you go about paying the, the capital gains tax on the collection short of just selling? Uh, this, is, yeah. this, is, this is a complicated question of taxes. And I think before, before taxes, before um, going into numbers, um, Charlie, do you have questions about, you know, you theoretically have questions about taxes sort of answered for the time being. What other questions do you think you have? Do you want to, if you don't want to think about um, cataloging, for example, or um, 
reporting or reaching out to collectors, do you rely on a handful of previous collectors or your dealers or your, I don't know, fan group? How do you um, think about uh, creating a secondary market, I suppose? How do I, cre I can't create a secondary market. Jim can, cre my dealer can create a secondary market. My collector can, I am in the secondary market in the print world and I have had paintings go out. Uh, you know, this idea of cataloging all my work at the state, my old friend of mine, David Hare, who was a surrealist sculptor artist, a wonderful artist from, he's passed away 25 years. He started at the end of his life taking photographs of all his work and he, he was never more depressed in his life when he started doing that. He was like wrapping himself up, building, like Kikwe, building his own coffin, you know, it's kind of thing just to put himself, put everything in. I don't, and it's also like a, a writer doing his own bibliography. There's certain things we don't need to do. I don't feel as artists, we should continually project ourselves forward. As long as my family doesn't suffer my abundance of work, I'll let the rest of the world figure it out. What all I would like to offer up is a, a new paradigm is instead of the Western European museum systems of putting art into those places where it makes your ego after death stronger, which is absurd because you don't have one after you pass, maybe your family does. Can we find other paradigms? There've got to be orphanages, teen centers, libraries, institutions that would like to have a wonderful piece of art that could be gifted to another in another way. Uh, high schools, I, I mean, I'm thinking, li I know libraries, I just, what I'd like to address is uh, uh, where an, a file, an inventory of mid-career and late-career artists who could provide in, uh, images to, to a database and people could ask for them and distribute them for tax, whatever, whatever tax rates, my CPA would tell me what that is. I don't get to take much more than the cost of my work when I donate it. So there are questions coming in and comments. So one of the comments we received yeah. was donating to a museum is a bit unrealistic because museums right now are happier to take cash donations to, and it's hard to get um, a confirmation or um, a, a buy-in from museums. So having this alternative space that takes art for storage, it's a great idea where maybe institutions can check out art for temporary or uh, long-term usage. That's, we can, it would be great if that's what comes out of the clinic. We ultimately have a space that both produces a digital catalog of works available and stores works for future retrieval. Um, Charlie, do you inventory your works? Do you have a way of fingerprinting them or? I sign, the list? You sign, I sign my name to them. And that's what I figure is my responsibility. Quite often dated. And, you know, through my life, I've got work that, you know, the, it's hard to figure that out. Um, I can't stop and do that in the middle of making art. It doesn't, there's two different left and right brain sides for me. You know, I actually, I have an alternative life. I'm a contractor, I build buildings. So I have, I have the ability to think on that side too. I, I like my contracting because I can build the building so I can make bad art. So I don't have to worry about working about the economic side of it. I mean, I found a lot of ways to protect myself. And at this stage, till you talked, to, till you invited me to do this, I never thought of this as a problem because I don't get up in the morning and say, I gotta get down to the studio and inventory my work in case. Well, it, it, I, I um, recently revisited uh, Edith Wharton's house in um, Lenox, Massachusetts. And uh, I was reading a description of how she wrote uh, when she was there, which consisted of lying in bed with a small, you know, lap desk and writing out longhand what she was doing. And as she got through with one page, she'd throw it on the floor until she had a pile and then she'd get up and go down and have breakfast. And her staff would come and pick up all the papers and try and sort them out. Many times what I find for artists is they shouldn't be doing the inventory because either they'll get distracted or they'll dive so deep into whatever it is. What you need to do is have somebody else 
come in and say, uh, I'm going to help inventory it. And the reason why I, I try to do it during the artist's lifetime is because you have to do an inventory in their estate anyway. So if you get the start on it, then you're you know light years ahead because in reality, you only have nine to 12 months to settle an estate. You can go longer than that, but um, you really need to be able to have that inventory off the, you know, right off the bat. And if you've already got a system for doing it, and it doesn't have to be that you've got, you know, uh, the most elaborate inventory in the world, it can be a three by five card. It can be a post-it note. Um, I did one, I, I had a collector and his inventory system was that um, he would scrawl on the catalog of the auctions that he bought things on what he had and he'd tear out that page and stick them in a pile. It doesn't matter so long as you get a start on. Um, so part of it is if you've got um, invoices for wherever you're going to be selling your art, that's the start of an inventory. Charlie, uh, does your ego, since we started talking, does it um, call out to you to say, why don't you set up a foundation? You can um, assemble a team of uh, willing participants. You can decide what, what the mission of that foundation will be, maybe distribution of arts to alternative spaces. Any interest? Well, I, my family comes first. I mean, that's my... My audience is my family, then the one outside. I'll take care of them first. I mean, there are a couple good ideas. This woman, Christina Newhouse, just in the chat room, and it's something I've done. I have thousands of works in uh, small university art museums. They're all over ubiquitous in Canada, United States, everywhere. And I actually went to a small college in West Virginia in the coal mine conference, played football down there, and I got my first taste of art from the small collection they had you know, with a $2,000 a month to buy a Louise Nevelson. And, I mean, so I, I like the idea of giving my work back to the ground, so to speak, not from the up to the top, back to the ground. I spent my whole life worrying about the top. I'm turning that over. I'm not going to participate in that. I'm just not going to. If, if it turns out to be, holy mackerel, he's the greatest thing since Camp Peaches, well, then that's all well and good. But you know, there's something you got to understand in an artist's life. <clears throat> and it's called time paints. What that means is you can have a painting and it doesn't look like much, but 10 years later, it's a masterpiece. There's all kinds of ways to look at this. And I'd rather live in that world, the poetry of that world, that narrative of, of just not being so practical because there's no doubt about it. The estate is based on what secondary market and what the value is. That creates the greed, that creates the avarice, that creates the the drive, that's why you have to have lawyers, not that I'm saying, you know, because there's something there. If there's nothing there, I like that idea. You know, just as a disruptor, like I like to say, what, what if you can't have it? What if I said to the Met, you can't have it? And they go, we weren't thinking about it anyway. I said, I don't care. I'm, it's like saying, you can't fire me, I quit, kind of comment. That's kind of a question. I think that on the on a, a doing something like creating a foundation, um, there's two two things that I find having actually created foundations. Um, the first is that most artists and most collectors, as I said, are more like entrepreneurs than they are like uh, the CEO of a you know Fortune 500 company, uh, and. Uh, you know, the reason why they work for themselves is because they just can't stand working with anybody else. The idea that you're going to have to uh, comply with all the rules and regulations of a foundation and, you know, think before you act is very difficult sometimes. That doesn't mean that you can't set up something that's the equivalent of a foundation, but perhaps it's not a non a, a nonprofit. And you just say, look, I, I'm going to get a uh, advisory board together. And I'm going to tell you guys what I'm going to do. And I want your opinion on things, because if I get run over by a truck, I'd like you guys to step in and take over 
so that things don't go sideways. Um, and sometimes I've done that. Yeah, there's but, an interesting found. I'm sorry, Matthew. I didn't mean to cut no, you. go right ahead. There's an interesting foundation concept up here in Maine. It's the Helica Lothan, Stephen Pace, two of them I know of, and there's others who have died, passed on, and don't have a large estate to give, and no collection is, it's not in any major collection, but they've given their residences on the coast to artists to go and spend time in the summers and the fall. Like, you know, just artist colonies. It's kind of like Yado style, McDowell style. So these are small little things. They hold, they have six people a month. They run 18 people through a year. And that's, an, that's a terrific gift. I can get behind something like that in a foundation. Yeah, mm -hmm. and th that's what's technically called a private operating foundation. Yeah. In that unlike a private foundation, which basically doesn't hold any assets other than stocks and bonds and cash and things like that, and does not, it makes grants to other nonprofits. A private operating foundation can hold art, buildings, houses, and can effectively, what you're doing is you're making a grant to the artists of the value of staying in the house. So it's uh, you know, private operating foundations straddle the line between a for-profit and a non-profit to a certain degree, in that they're able to do these things directly to individuals. So yes, it's a very clever idea. And it's also one of those things where you were saying, I'd like my artwork to be here and there and the other places. If you had a private operating foundation, conceivably you could uh, keep ownership of your art and say, I'm gonna put it on loan at this museum. But you know, if this museum decides it doesn't want it anymore, you can't sell it. You gotta give it back to me so I can put it in this other museum that wants it. Um, so there are, you know, once I hear what people want, I can, I, I can create whatever they need. I, what I say is, please tell me what you want. I'll see if I can make it legal. So this brings, um, there are a couple of um, really good questions um, in the chat, but it brings me to um, the subject of different states. Uh, we put in our handouts a sampling because Again, we don't know the questions you guys have and can't answer everything at once, but different states treat these foundations differently, right? The setup is that can, can vary from Maine to Massachusetts to New York. So would you say that's correct? Or would you say that um, artists need to find attorneys who do trust in the states or work in the states where they want the foundation to operate? Usually if you comply with the federal laws, you are, are complying with the state laws. There are probably some uh, changes in reporting and some changes in preparation of uh, tax returns. But in a, you know, the, the place that people fall down on foundations is that they don't comply with the regulations and requirements for uh, particularly whether or not you have, uh, you're having a benefit go to a member of the family. So it is, um, you know, uh, going to be, if you comply with the federal law, it's very likely that you will, without too much trouble, be able to comply with the state law. Um, now, who knows what this is going to be after the current Congress. There has been a um, move afoot to make it that foundations have to distribute more of their assets every year and to break up uh, you know, certain foundations which seem to be very uh, large. And uh, I think today there was a New York Times article about uh, the ex-wife of Jeff Bezos and people saying, well, she gives money away, but she doesn't tell us how she gives money away. She gives money to public charities, but we wanna know their criteria. And I'm like, she's given away tens of billions of dollars worth of assets and you're complaining. Uh, so it just shows that no matter what you do, somebody's gonna complain about it. Can I bring up one point about inventory? Cause that's been talked about. So when we talk about inventory, you're talking about Bartleby the Scribner. We sit down and scri scribe each work of art where it went. Now that's the old paradigm. The new one to me is Instagram. When I work in my studio, I take pictures on Instagram of what I'm doing. My work is recorded. 
since its inception on that format. I know my emails are legally binding. If I make a decision via email to, to agree to something, that, that transmits, why can't my Instagram account give some record of what my inventory is it's rather than me sitting down with a loose leaf notebook trying to scribe this stuff and take a photograph of everything. Do you get what I'm pointing out? There's some change yeah. in the one. And, a and, way. and I've had clients that I've said, I want you to walk around with your iPhone with a video on. Right. And I want you to stand in front of something and say, you know, I bought that from Joe. I paid about 200 bucks for it. I've always liked it when it's there. That's enough. I don't need to have the, you know, Barnaby the Scrivener, uh, you know, you don't need to have comply with the Getty, uh, you know, standards on description of artwork, but you have to have something. Uh, and I, I for, because the reason is, you know what you've got. You know whether or not it's actually something that you meant to have be of value, or it was the fact that you crumpled up a piece of paper and threw it out the other day, right? Your heirs and your executors may not know. So if you give them some indication that you like it, and this is the reason why you like it, and the reason why you have it, that's enough. Um, I have to just point out that um, it's almost one o'clock. Um, we typically are happy and we build in a little bit of overtime. Um, if there are questions that left unanswered, if it's okay uh, with our speakers, we can stay another 10 or 15 minutes. And the participants, we need to sign out um, or have other uh, plans after this. Uh, we will be sharing with you links that we have uh, been putting into the chat. Uh, we're also looking for suggestions and we're building sort of a coalition of um, like-minded um, experts, artists um, who would like to see um, semi-organized estate planning process. If, for example, there's somebody out there who has a space they're willing to maybe donate for storage, or if there's somebody who's interested in maybe being paired up with artists to help with inventory, writing articles. Um, I think there are lots of possible relationships that we can build as a result. Um, no, we're not trying to preserve 100% of everybody's artistic uh, production, but I think it's a, it's a good way of creating art history now, uh, rather than getting upset about uh, something going missing because um, the resources were not allocated towards that project in advance. So um, thank you for those who are here and who need to uh, jump off. Uh, for those of you who are willing to stay a little bit longer, I wanted to acknowledge that we have a number of artists um, and non-artists participating um, in this program today. We have Kazima Rahman, who is going to talk about collection management, um, uh, not only because Matthew mentioned it, but it is because it's a big part of estate planning discussion. Uh, we also have artists who have participated in our um, art and auction, art and law auction. So thank you for being here. If you have questions, put them in the chat. Um, all right. So one of the questions we received in advance was about galleries working with artist estates um, and whether there is a rule of thumb how much galleries can expect or should ask to receive from the sale. You know, the consignment agreements change perhaps, and maybe there is a different. Um, golden ratio for how much gallery can receive if they do a good job of representing and uh, protecting legacy of artists. Is there anything, um, Matthew, you can share with us? How much should a, you expect the gallery to uh, charge? Well, uh, again, I'll give you the lawyer answer. It depends. Um, if you have an artist that it's very easy to sell artwork, then you may want to go for a lower commission. Um, if you have an artist that, in, in other words, Charlie said he's got 850 of the prints that he's got, you might be able to sell those, but it might take you 10 years. And that commission structure may be very different from the person who is selling, you know, the, the equivalent of a the Mona Lisa, which you can sell at any time. Um, so uh, it really depends. Um, I, 
you know, it's whatever the market will bear, I guess. Uh, I've seen commissions go as low as uh, 5%. I've seen them go as high as 50%. Depends on the situation. Uh, you know, when you have several thousand prints that were done by the same artist, and you know it's going to be a horrendous task to sell them, you might be a much higher commission to inspire people to get things done. Um, Charlie, you mentioned a couple of, um, not exactly foundations, but residences that have been created. Are, can you mention them again? Yeah, well, there's, uh, yeah, uh, Stephen Pace, <clears throat> I know of, and there's a Helica Lothan. Those are, and there's another one called the Rabkin, R-A-B-K-I-N Foundation. He set up, he bought a, 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 actually he bought a space I built in Portland and uh, he set up a foundation to give $50,000 grants a year to, to, art, to art writing. And in that space that does the work of finding out who to give these grants to, he exhibits his work and tries to have a life beyond the, his life. And they show the work outside of the studio context, try to make connections, and we go in and see something we never would see before. Uh, what, what I really I mean, I've enjoyed about your first narrative about why we do this, it's preserving the art of the 20th and 21st century, really. And that's noble. Artists should be remembered beyond. Not all artists were, are going to be successful, but that's just the way it works. Uh, I mean, some will be fairly successful, some enormously. All we pay attention to are the enormously successful ones. And so, and someday, <clears throat> maybe if there is a foundation or a file to record my time on this earth or somebody else's and the work I've contributed to that time, that'd be noble and that'd be terrific. Uh, we, we spend a lot of time <clears throat> on celebrities and not enough time on the artists. There's you never know, yeah, you never know. Um... I had a client who was a mechanical uh, drafting professor at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. And he had a book that he had written in the 1940s on mechanical drawing, which he got about $3.25 a year on royalties for, because who's doing mechanical drawing anymore? Yeah. Until about four years before his death, when he started getting checks for $20,000, $30,000 a year. And he was flabbergasted and he called up his agent and said, what's going on? He says, we can't keep them in stock. We're printing them as fast as we can. And it turns out that there was somebody who designed a CAD CAM program, computerized design, that on the first page of the instructions, it said, go buy Professor Wellman's book on mechanical drawing. It's the best thing you'll have. And everybody who bought that program went out and bought the book. So sometimes it may not be worth anything today, but it might be worth something tomorrow. Yeah, there's two points here. One is I hope my daughter and son come see you someday. That would be terrific. That would be a full trip and say, <clears throat> what are you going to do with my dad's work? Or maybe your son would do a fifth generation. The other yeah. artist that comes to mind to me is Herman Melville. I mean, if you talk to Herman at the end of his life, he'd say, look, I'm a retired custom clerk. I'm writing Billy Butt in the Attic. Nobody knows who I am. I mean, that's what I mean about preserving the 20th and 21st century. What would happen if that was burned or thrown out or, or like I just did, the scrap guy comes and turns it into tin cans. Melville but at least, you, at least you have an image of what you threw out. Good point. Uh, in true. other words, uh, and in fact, there have been a number of artists that, and writers uh, and letters, you know, uh, particularly during the Victorian era, oh, these are too scandalous. We can't preserve these. We're going to go out and burn them. Uh, and you never know what's in there. No, I agree. That's the mystery of time. You know, it's like what happens. Unfortunately, I have to run. But, All um, right. I, Matthew, thank you so much. Um, I we I really will have more questions for you. I, I really appreciate your, your giving me this opportunity and I appreciate all the work that you put into this. Um, if people want to contact me, I'll do my, you know, the shameless self-promotion. I do have a website um, and uh, you can uh, you know, find articles and such. 
I'm also more than happy to, you know, answer people's questions to the best of my ability. Uh, so thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Matthew. We will share both your website and Charlie's website in the handouts. I also wanted to say thank you to all who um, I hope kindly- Charlie, I hope Charlie will give you a commission if he sells any of his artwork through your reference. That's right. I'm going to keep a list of it. I'll tell you. Oh, okay. <laughs> now you got to start your inventory, eh? Yeah, Matthew. There I'm should gonna... be a discount. Center for Art Love Friends and just Family. Like, it's just like my CPA. I give her a cardboard box full of receipts and she figures it out. That's what I think life's about. Yeah, the bigger box theory of accounting. All right. Take care, Matthew. It was a pleasure. Thank Bye -bye. you, Matthew. Um, I wanted to um, say two more thanks. One is to everybody who's been able to donate towards this event. We um, are very pleased to be able to offer these events for free to artists and students, and um, we make good use of your donations. Um, also mentioning Instagram and how useful it's becoming. Um, the center has been exploring um, a new series on Instagram. We're featuring foundations that are um, artists endowed foundations. I think Rapkin Foundation was just featured this week. And if any of our uh, audience members would like to make suggestions, um, which organizations, foundations to highlight, that would be delightful. Um, any last questions for Charlie before we wrap up? Um, think about it. Um, if you have questions about um, copyright, and I'm sure, and there, I know there are many, um, we will have a keynote by Yayoi Shayanori um, on July 14th. So if you uh, would like to come in, she is um, um, executive director for um, which estate, please? Um, the, the Chris Burden estate. Chris, Chris Burden estate, she will talk about copyright. Um, if you have questions that we have not covered, please send them in and we will continue with our webinars in the fall. Um, this program is going to be archived on our website, so come back and listen to it. Any more questions? Shirley, if you have questions, you know where to find us. Yes, and maybe we can come and um, see your studio at some point. I think that would be a, a wonderful opportunity. Well, Field trip. I when I finish my greenhouse, my I call it the electric garage. You got to come to Portland. It's going to be hot. It's going to be great. Sounds so, brilliant. Welcome, Tom. Thank you. I didn't know what I was doing here, but I'm glad I can contribute in any way. So, just throw out. Thank you, Anna. I Bye. think we're making progress. We're making art for sure. Maybe a little bit of art law along the way. Yeah, and I, I'm going to follow up on the 14th because I'm I am copywriting hopeful. Uh, that was one of the problems Bob Indiana had. He never copyrighted it. So it was showing up on everything, everywhere. So he was always concerned about that. So I, I learned the lesson. Since I'm going on beer cans, it's time for me to get copyright. So I'm going to watch that thing. Brilliant. And then see you in July. Everybody, yes. um, thank Bye. you so much for being with us today. And we will see you soon. Take Bye -bye. care. Thank you, everyone. We'll send all the recordings, all the materials, surveys, etc. Keep an eye out for our message. And we have to see you, I believe next week, we have an, our next program is on art funds, um, which not a lot of us know what they are. So we'll talk about that. And then um, after that, uh, a workshop on estate planning taught by Kasima Rahman. So we hope that you can all uh, make it and uh, stay in touch. Thank you very much. <laughs>